John 16, and then we'll see if we can slide into John 17. We'll get maybe get into that just a little bit tonight, and um, we'll take a break for a season, a couple of seasons, and then we'll come back and do a study of John 17. I'll never, I'll never forget... Um, I was a young pastor um, out at the church in Richwoods, Missouri, beautiful little church out in the country. And for the very first time, um, I was just reading the scriptures and reading John 17. And it occurred to me what it was. It was Christ's... Um, singular prayer to his father shortly before his crucifixion and the the deep emotion that at the time when I was reading it I I was enraptured in that emotion and uh, I was reading this and I was crying my eyes out I could see really now, I hate to say for the very first time, because I've been in church all my life, but, you know, God just hits you at times in different ways and and so on. And, and on this particular day, it would have been probably a Friday or a Saturday, uh, God hit me with this John 17 and this prayer that Jesus is praying. And um, you just feel the, the, the absolute bond between Jesus Christ and his heavenly father and you're hearing truth from jesus that before the world ever was they were together and they were one and and they, they everything was fine there was no problems there was no sinners on earth to deal with uh, why did god have to go out of his way to make all this creation and put a bunch of lousy sinners on it that would ruin everything that would kill his only begotten son and yet his son would turn around and say i love you and do that for us and then then you see he's praying for his disciples the ones that god has given him and he and at one point he says make them one as we are and i'm man i lost it on that i just god that is amazing and um just in it just i don't think i i don't think i even preached that not the next sunday not any sunday for a long time after that I don't, I don't i couldn't remember when i've ever just preached john 17 uh but it to me it's a holy it's a holy chapter i know the whole bible is holy but for me there was just this very very special holiness that was there in the words of christ and again, the use of the, the one time use of the phrase Holy Father that he says to his father alone and for any man to take on that title, even even allow to for any man to even allow someone to call him that I would be like shame on you. Shame on you. If I if I was if I was all of a sudden elected Pope and they said, Holy Father. And I would like, no, no, you're not calling me that. I'm changing all of this. You're not ever going to call me that. There is one Holy Father and I'm not. And of course, I'd probably be dead in 33 days like John Paul I was or quicker than that. But anyway, we're going to get into that. And um, I may not have the same enthusiasm uh, the same um, thrill in me that I did uh, so many days ago. That would have been probably around 1992, something like that, 93. Uh, that was a while back for me, but um, I'll never forget it. It was just a wonderful blessing for me. So John chapter 16, and... Um, let me put this up on the screen. That's where we are here. John chapter 16, and we'll read uh, these two verses. But let's go to the Lord in uh, prayer, 
Um, we have several uh, prayer requests that have come in. Um, Chris Gunn um, has got a member of his family that's been in a car accident just now. Uh, they're at the hospital. Um, we'll see how things go. Um, he just sent that to me a few minutes before church started. So pray for uh, the Gunn family. Uh, I talked to my mom. She's very, very sick. All this congestion and stuff in her lungs and throat. And she's running a fever and got chills. And, and I said, Mom, why don't you come to church and give that to everybody? And she said no. She didn't want to do that. Uh, so pray for her. Um, there was somebody else too. Oh, I talked to uh, Philip today on the phone. He called and um, he at first thought that he might get out uh, in March, but apparently that was wrong and he won't be out until November. But he's asking us not to forget him. And I told him we wouldn't. And I told him we would pray for him and ask God to bless him. Um, and so you do that, okay? Uh, that's biblical. That's godly. That's, that's what Jesus separated the sheep from the goats from, was whether or not we even cared about those who were in prison. Can you say amen? That was one of the criteria. So let's pray for this one and pray that as God prepares him for the day that he gets out, that uh, God would also uh, give him a better life going into the rest of his life than what he's had before. I know a little bit about what he's had in the past, and it's not been good. And uh, a lot of it was not his fault. Some of it was, but uh, some terrible things were done to him. So pray, pray for him, all right? Father, we love you, and we thank you, God, for... Uh, meeting us tonight we thank you lord for this opportunity to come into your service midweek lord i know not every church has midweek service i know lord churches that used to have one don't have one anymore and they've gone to just one one service uh, but father lord it's good to for us to get together in your house since we have the opportunity we have the time uh, we have the privilege yet to come into your house and Lord, uh, as far as this book goes, and as far as our country is right now, we can say and preach and teach anything that this book says for us to do. Father, those liberties don't come easily. They don't come free. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for men and women, Lord, who have fought battles over the past years for our country to remain a free country. Uh, for those, Lord, on the home front, uh, police officers and whatnot, Lord, who keep us safe day in and day out, Lord, and to protect the laws that we have. And for those, Father, who stand up against tyranny, even right here in this country. Father, we thank you for that. And Lord, as long as we have those freedoms and those liberties taken not away, help us, Father, every day to take advantage of the time that we have, for the time runs short, quicker than we think. And Lord, we may lose all of this one of these days, and we'll wish we had it back. So Father, bless us now, while the opportunity is there, while the time is there, while the people uh, will still listen to the gospel. Lord, I, I am very, very fearful of what is coming down the road what, and what may come quickly. And so, Father, I pray, God, that you would prepare your people for days that are coming. Lord, shape us, make us in your image every day. Forgive us of our sins. Use us for your glory's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, uh, John 16, uh, verse 20. There's just a couple of verses I want to I want to go into uh, dealing with this idea of the woman having travail. And... Um, uh, one, one verse in particular is a tremendous blessing to me, and, and, and it is to somebody else in this church, and they know who it is. Uh, but in verse 20, John 16, Jesus is teaching, and he says, Verily, verily. And I don't know if you've ever noticed. John is the only of the four Gospels where Jesus says, Verily, twice. Who knew that? 
Three. Okay, in the other Gospels, he will say verily. He'll only say it once. Okay, so it makes John unique. I don't, I don't know exactly why, but it makes it unique. Verily, he says, I say unto thee. But in John, he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And people get used to that one. Get used to that one. Where we weep and lament at the shape of the world or things that have happened. While the world will rejoice and we wonder why they're rejoicing. Can't they see that this is evil? Can't they see these are times are bad? Or can't they see how the world is shaping up? And I'm telling you, lost people don't know and lost people don't care. All they want to is to retain and maintain their sinful lifestyle unless the Holy Ghost deals with them and gets a hold of them. That's all they care about. So you give them any presidential candidate, you give them any candidate whatsoever that can promise them that they can rally in their uh, 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 sinful ways and continue on and, and further and advance it like... So many are doing. I got a thing in the mail today. I was, I was going to bring it out here. But it was um, from some a school district where they wanted to raise the uh, real estate tax a huge amount of money uh, so that the schools could have all of that money. And it was put out by the, um, by the Republican party of that area and on the on one cover or one side of this flyer it had a man in drag and they were going this is what you'll be paying for more of this and i'm going that's an effective if i got that in the mail and i and they were and and the the flyer was warning people not to vote this tax increase in because that's what it was going to end up doing. Schools would get this money and it was going to get more money perpetually in perpetuity. It was always going to just keep raising and raising. And they would get all this money to waste on garbage like that. And I'm going, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's not what we need to teach our kids in school. Amen. And there are, pe there are families who are standing up to it. Uh, and I'll just share this and I'll move on. Uh, did you hear about uh, one particular city in North Carolina where, and I don't know, if you're the mayor of a town, why do you need a city manager? I, that's what I thought the mayor was, right? Isn't he the manager of the city? But now it's the thing where you get to be mayor and to... Further enjoy the blessings of this high salary with very little work. You hire a city manager to do everything for you. Well, they hired this city manager, apparently a BLM activist. And the day they hired her, every person on the police force in that city drove their cars into the station, handed their keys and their badge in and said, we're out. Every cop in that city resigned on the spot and said, now, here's your city. You can have it. The, at some point, either the people of this country have got to wake up to what the unelected bureaucracy is doing to them or they deserve to have it done one way or the other. And that's, that's what I say here. Uh, verily, I, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. So I'm sure everybody was going, oh, she's going to be so good for our city. You know, she's going to be. So... And the cops said, see ya. Don't call us. Don't ask us to uh, limit your speed limits. Don't ask us to check out somebody in your house. Don't ask us to investigate your murders. Don't ask us to do anything. They have no police force right now. Anyway, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow, here's the promise, people don't give up, your sorrow shall be turned to joy. And, and again, it's, he's given this illustration of a woman in travail. You're in sorrow, women, I, I don't know how all you women were with birthing, but 
you know, it's like, I wish I'd never got pregnant ever. I wish I'd never done this. This was the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. I don't want this thing. Get it out of me. Maybe you were like that. Okay. Not saying I know that from experience, but I have heard stories. Okay. And, um, but then the baby's born. Boom. And where is all that now? It's gone. Because her hour has come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice in your joy. No man taketh from you. So imagine in the days prior to the Lord appearing in the air, and how bad our anguish, our sorrow, our pain will be. And then boom. Jesus appears and takes it all away. Folks, this is, this is why we got saved to begin with. It wasn't to get rich on this earth. It wasn't so we could have health and prosperity. It wasn't any of that. God. We got saved so that we would have it better in the next life. That's why. Okay? Uh, so turn to... Um, I love this passage. Isaiah 54. Uh, I, I actually happened across this passage several years ago. I was studying numbers. I was studying, uh, in fact, I was studying the number nine, to be honest with you. And I was studying, uh, and this idea of the, of the uh, travailing woman had already entered into my, uh, the, I had already made notes on this, and so I had it in the back of my mind. And then somehow, some way, I came across this passage, and I, man, I wanted to shout. I did. I wanted to jump. I wanted, and I couldn't write notes fast enough. And I know I've got this in notebooks somewhere, but anyway, it, it, it is uh, uh, Isaiah 54, single barren, thou that didst not bear. So th now think of um, in the Bible, you have all these stories about maybe two wives and one of them could bear children one of them couldn't you had uh, you had Leah Leah was was the one bearing children her and her uh a servant and uh Rachel none Rachel you know Leah seven Rachel zero okay and um and it was it was quite a uh, conflict between them God was blessing the one not loved while the one loved, he was not blessing. Okay? But that was all for a reason. Same thing with Hannah and Peninnah. Peninnah was the one not loved by Elkanah, and yet she was having the babies. But Hannah, poor Hannah, wasn't having any. Um, and you just had that story, uh, you know, reverberated all through the scriptures. And, and, uh, uh, Sarah, Sarah can't have any babies, so she says, here, take Hagar, my servant. Maybe that's how God's going to do it. Sarah was wrong. She did wrong. She didn't, she, God said, no, it's going to be you, Sarah. And she thought, well, Hagar's mine, so maybe that's what he means. Don't, and that's, that's the problem. We assume too much out of what we think God meant instead of focusing on what he said. And God said, I never said that. But I'm going to allow it because I'm going to prove a point here. So sure enough, Hagar uh, brings forth a child. And, and Sarah, does Sarah feel any satisfaction? No. She's still barren. And she still doesn't believe it. God comes by in Genesis 18 with the two angels. And God is saying, you know, you're going to have a baby. And Sarah's in the tent laughing. And God calls her out and says, why didn't you believe me? She said, oh, you know, well, I believe you. And she said, he said, no, you were laughing. And she said, I didn't laugh. He said, yeah, you did laugh. Now you're lying. But I'm telling you, you're going to have a baby. This time next year, you're going to be singing baby songs to your baby. And sure enough, that's exactly how it happened. So here, this is what this prophecy is about. It is about Israel, who has, is barren. Right now, us, the Gentile, we're the one bearing much fruit. But Israel is barren. So, God says, sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate 
than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. In other words, the one who didn't have any of the babies is going to end up with more on her side than the one who was having the babies to begin with. In other words, God is going to give whatever He has blessed the Gentile church with in the past 2,000 years, He's going to double it for Israel. That's what I believe. He's going to double it for them. And then He says, uh, verse 2, Enlarge the place of thy tent. In other words, you better get some more tent poles and some more canvas. Why? Because you're going to need room for them babies. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations and spare not. Lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. you look at that verse again if Mary is the mother of the creator in verse 5 here thy maker is thine husband what does that mean now that Mary married Jesus her son that's disgusting that's sick that's perverse that Babylonian doctrine what that is that, that idea comes from ancient Sumeria, ancient battle, where Sepharitus was the uh, wife of Nimrod. Nimrod died, and um, somehow, some way, uh, there's variances in the story, but Semiramis gives birth to Temuz, or Tammuz, or Tammuz, Demuzid is another name for him, and then becomes his wife. He married his mother. There's therapists for that. Okay? There's psychiatrists who deal with that kind of stuff all the time. But that's, that's the myth of it. So it is biblically impossible for Mary to be the mother of the Creator. It's not possible. And it just, again, it angers me. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. And of course, we are talking about Jesus Christ. And we're not talking about Mary here. We're talking about Israel. Uh, for the Lord, verse 6, 
hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit like uh, like Hannah was, like Sarah was, like Rachel was. Grieved in spirit because they couldn't have a child. Elizabeth, grieved in spirit. Um, the Shunammite woman, grieved in spirit because she couldn't have a child. The Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and, uh, and a wife of youth. When thou wast refused, saith thy God. Verse 7, for a small moment have I forsaken thee. But with great mercies will I gather thee. Now that, and of course all of this you can apply to your life. But that verse right there is how God deals with you in times of joy, in times of gladness, and in times of sorrow. Had there been times when God has been angry at you? Say amen. At least that's better than the laugh I got a while ago. Yes, he has. But does God remain angry with us forever? No. For a small moment, verse 7, have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment. So, there were times when you prayed and it didn't seem like God heard you, it didn't seem like God was answering you, and fear gripped your heart and you said, God, if you don't do something, I'm, I'm dead, I'm toast, this is it, I'm out of here, I'm done. I've been there. Didn't seem like God was hearing me. God was answering me. God was, God was angry with me for a moment. But then, with everlasting kindness. How, how long does that kindness last? Everlasting. Will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. Now verse 9. And I, I think I was studying the, the number 9 and this is what came up. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. And by the way, uh, just for example, the sign that the woman is going from pregnant to non-pregnant is what? The waters. The waters are the sign. Okay? She can have contractions. Oh, are you counting the contractions? Yes. How far apart are they? Oh, they're like eight minutes apart. They're 10 minutes apart. They're 12 minutes apart. Oh, this is getting pretty strong. Oh, but all of that doesn't necessarily mean the baby's going to be born soon. But when that water breaks, that's it. There's, there's no turning back. That baby somehow, someway has got to be Delivered. That baby's going to be delivered. And so, when Jesus told us now, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Don't you think that there is some connection between the waters gushing forth out of the womb of the earth and then the appearing of Christ. Now I can take you, I'll take you back to that. Go to Genesis 9. I'll take you right back to it. I, I don't remember how I came across this, how I hit it, but when I hit it, man, I thought, oh, I've got a gold mine here. God said, Genesis 9, 12, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring, not if, but when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. 
And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it and that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is, that is upon the earth. And you follow that, that, that rainbow in the cloud. You have uh, Joseph. The beloved son of Jacob wearing that coat of many colors, just like a rainbow. You have um, in, in Ezekiel 1, when Ezekiel sees the man sitting on the throne, he says he sees uh, a bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. And he said, this is the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And he's, you put all these together. You get this idea that this bow that he's talking about here is Christ coming in the clouds. The waters have broke forth. But when that happens and the cloud comes over the land, God says, look up. You're going to see the token of the, the sign of my promise to you. Jesus, this time, is the one who's going to be in that cloud Somehow arrayed in many colors. And I think God's people are going to shout on that day. Amen. I hope for heaven's sake that all of us are having the worst day possible. So that when we look up and see him up there, we're going, Woo! That's just exactly what I was hoping for today. Amen. So, Isaiah... 54, back verse 9, For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. Boom. This is God's way in Isaiah of saying, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. All of this, all of this tied into this issue of a, a woman that is, that is going to give birth. And we touched on, I'm not going to touch on it any longer, but we touched on the idea of uh, the, the birthing of two different children. Number one, the man of sin, the son of perdition, uh, rising up out of the sea. Um, and then Christ, uh, his second coming, pictured as a woman giving birth in Revelation 12. And she is in travail in Revelation 12. And of course, the devil's right there to consume him as soon as he's born. Uh, we know that's not going to happen. It didn't happen in Egypt. It didn't happen when Christ came the first time. It's not going to happen again. Uh, God is going to take care of it. And Christ is going to be victorious over all things. I love this. It blesses my heart every time I talk about it, every time I think about it. Uh, one more verse and then we're going to go to uh, uh, chapter uh, 17, just the first part. But uh, Romans 8 says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. I think that's why you're going to see earthquakes in diverse places. I think there's going to be um, the sea and the waves roaring. I think the whole earth is going to be travailing like, you know, it's in pain, like it's about ready to give birth. Uh, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Who in here has ever been in a day where you honestly believe that the only way you were ever going to make it through that day was for Jesus to appear in the clouds and take you to heaven. I will raise my hand. I have been there. I didn't think... I didn't think God could do anything else but that to get me through that day. But He did. 
And when I look at those days that he did that for me, and I think about how grand and glorious the things that he has done for me in those days, it's like the Holy Spirit says, they pale in comparison, Mike, to what you're going to experience on the day that I do this thing for real. You're just going to fall completely out of your skull on that day. In fact, you're going to be so overjoyed, your skin and body and flesh and bones are going to fall completely off of you on that day. Yes! And you're just going to be, I'm going to give you a brand new body to cover up the soul. I'm going to give you new clothes. I'm going to give you everything new. You're going to be flying in the air. Yes! Can't wait. Can't wait. But he, and he said, uh, we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. That's what I just said. The old body is going to be peeled off, taken off, dropped off, rotted off, burned off. Who cares? Whatever. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And I, I, I just, these guys that, that go around saying, yeah, I've seen heaven. Oh, God's, I've been to heaven several times. God showed me heaven and, and I know what it looks like. And boy, I, I, don't, I don't buy into that. I don't buy it. Number one, I wouldn't want to right now. I wouldn't want to. I don't want to see heaven now. I want to hope for heaven. Because what I see, I don't hope for. I already have it. The idea of your best life now, it's that, that does, none of that makes any Christian biblical sense. It's like saying God's going to give you all of the glory and the blessings of eternity. He's going to give it to you in your life right now. And that is not how it's going to be. God is going to give you something better to look forward to. Amen? Um, well, let's see here. John, go back to John 16 and... Uh, there's a little story that I read one time years ago, and I shared it with the church many, many years ago. That this person who um, was dying told uh, his loved ones that he said, when I die and I'm in the casket, I want you to put a fork in my hand. And they said, why? And he told them, he said, you know, you go to a restaurant and you eat the meal and everything like that. And they say, OK, we're going to bring you out some dessert. So save your fork. Hold on to your fork. Save your fork because we're going to bring you dessert. So they clear off the table and they bring you this great dessert. So you've got a fork now to eat it with. And, and it's the idea that. When you see me in the casket, don't worry, the best is yet to come. That's why I'm holding the fork. And somebody said, Brother Mike, when we see you in a casket, we'll know why you're holding a fork. I went, okay, thanks, appreciate that. Uh, to finish out the chapter, John 16, and he says this, And ye now therefore have sorrow. But I will see you again. That's the greatest promise of the Christian faith is the promise that Christ is coming again and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you. Because man didn't give it, man can take it away. And, and you can apply that, I've said this over the years, you can apply that to everything. If, if, if your favorite thing in the world to do, like mine was when I was when Elvis died. I, all I wanted to do was listen to Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley. I listened to Elvis Presley all the time, and I liked it. And finally, I got convicted about it, but I still kept doing it. And finally, I just said, "God, take this away from me. I don't want. I don't want to listen to this anymore. He's he's not right." He, and so finally, God took it away. No preacher told me I had to do it. My mom didn't tell me I had to do it. I just I just gave it up. And once I gave it up, I didn't want to go back to it. 
Didn't want to go back anymore. When God takes it away, it's gone. When God gives it to you, it stays. And that's what he's saying here. And he said in verse 23, And in that day, and I want you to ponder this for a minute, In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, He'll give it to you. And I believe that. I believe that day is coming. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs. But I shall show you plainly of the Father. And that day ye shall ask in my name and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you for the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God in other words uh, I, I am the mediator now but there's coming a day you're going to ask and God says oh, I'm going to do it Jesus you don't even have to ask I'm going to do it because they loved you they followed you to the end and I'm going to do it for them um, verse 28, I came forth from the Father and am come again into the world, or am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. And at that moment, it was sealed among them. They were going to be his disciples into um, the next, all the way through the crucifixion unto the resurrection. Verse 31, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, and you shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in, now listen to this now. And I'm, I'm going to close with this. In, in, in me, you might have peace. In the world, ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, I'm not going to do this again now. I'm not going to run through all the verses in the Bible that talk about tribulation. But I am going to ask you to do something. Okay? And I think that if you'll do this and do it, be honest about it, uh, I think God will help you out with something. You may have more questions than answers. I do. Um, but to me, things just make better sense. Pretend, if at all possible, that you have never, ever heard a sermon, read a Sunday school book, read a prophecy book, read a commentary, heard somebody on radio preachers ever say anything about the seven-year tribulation. Pretend that that idea and that concept has never entered your mind one time okay when you get to that point then you personally go through the whole bible every place the bible says the word tribulation or tribulations you read that verse. You read before, what comes after. You read, make a big circle around it, walk circumspectly. So you read the chapter before, that chapter, the chapter after. You read the whole book if you want to. Go to the next one. Do the same thing again. Go to the next one. Do the same thing again. And then read every place in the Bible where it uses the word tribulation or tribulations. And pretend that you have never heard of a seven-year tribulation. And here's one thing that I would guarantee you. You would never go through the Bible, go through it 30 times. You would never come out and say, I think it's going to be a seven-year tribulation. You'd never do it. 
Never would. Um, and I meant it. I did. I, I, God just put that in my heart. The, the calling to study prophecy was uh, 19... Let's see, 1997, November. And... Um, it wasn't too long. I don't remember exactly when, but I just, as I was reading, I just decided that I was going to forget everything. And it's hard to do because I don't think I've done it yet. Um, but I was going to assume that I didn't know nothing about Bible prophecy, eschatology. I, I, was, I didn't take a class on it in college, which I did. Um, none of that. I wasn't, I, I wasn't going to put myself in anybody's ism or anybody's camp or anybody's idea. I was just going to search the scriptures, ask God questions and see what, see what scriptures came as the answer. And that's the answer that I have, uh, that I have adopted is, I don't believe it exists. But there is a time of tribulation, a time of great tribulation. And we, in the world, we shall have tribulation. But, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Take that. Take that with you. Rather than, for anything bad happens, God's, God's going to, I'm going to escape out of here so that I don't have to worry about any. I, I mean, that may suit you, but that may not happen. So, anyway.